Hi everyone, welcome to our module on biliary disorders. I'll start by briefly reviewing the biliary tree. Bile is formed in the liver and transmitted via the common hepatic duct into the gallbladder. Bile is stored in the gallbladder and during a meal it is released via the common bile duct into the duodenum where it passes through the sphincter vodi and the ampulla vata in order to reach the small intestine. Our first biliary disorder is biliary atresia. Atresia means a closed or absent orifice, and in this case we're talking about closed or an absent bile duct. This is an idiopathic condition, which means we don't know what causes it, and it presents in newborn babies or neonates. In these children, the bile ducts do not form for reasons that we don't understand, or they degenerate early in life. As a result, these babies do not have a conduit to transmit bile from the liver into the intestines, and they present with symptoms of obstruction of biliary flow. So those symptoms, as we've discussed in many of the GI modules, include jaundice and dark urine and pale colored stools, which are called acolic stools. Now when babies are born with these symptoms, an ultrasound is often performed to see if there's some obstruction to biliary flow. And what the ultrasound usually shows in babies with biliary atresia is absence of the gallbladder, or it's very abnormal. There's also usually absence of the common bile duct. And importantly, there are no other causes of biliary obstruction. There are no strictures or gallstones or anything like that. And the treatment is a special surgery called the Kasai procedure, where they create a conduit for bile drainage from the liver using a portion of the small intestine. The next disorder we're going to discuss is called primary biliary cirrhosis. But before we can talk about that, let's define the term biliary cirrhosis. This is an old term that's not used much anymore for liver damage from biliary obstruction. So years ago, if you had chronic obstruction of biliary flow, this would lead to liver damage. So if you had gallstones or pancreatic cancer, or biliary strictures in the era before there were surgeries and treatments for these conditions, you would eventually develop cirrhosis secondary to biliary obstruction, and that was called biliary cirrhosis. So primary biliary cirrhosis is biliary cirrhosis that develops without an extrahepatic obstruction. So it occurs without a gallstone or a mass in the pancreas. The obstruction is inside the liver, and it leads to cirrhosis. It's an autoimmune disorder. It's mediated by T cells, and they attack intralobular bile ducts. And I've bolded the words T-cell and intralobular bile ducts because those are high-yield things to remember for step one. It's also high-yield to remember that this is a form of granulomatous inflammation, and this is a picture of a granuloma on the screen here to remind you of that fact. This condition is more common among women, and in many cases it has an unusual initial presentation. The two most common symptoms at initial presentation are fatigue and puritis. Puritis is itching, and the reason for puritis in primary biliary cirrhosis is that when the bile ducts are obstructed, there's impaired excretion of bile acids, and therefore the level of bile acids rises in the serum, and they deposit in the skin where they can cause intractable itching. The reason it's so important to remember itching as a symptom of primary biliary cirrhosis is because itching often precedes the development of jaundice. So women with this condition may present only with itching. It can sometimes be misdiagnosed as a skin condition. The itching is often severe, and it can be worse at night. So it's important to understand that any cause of biliary obstruction can raise the level of serum bile acids and cause itching. You can see itching with many of the disorders we're going to talk about in this video. But in primary biliary cirrhosis, it's often the initial complaint prior to the development of anything like jaundice or right upper quadrant pain that might tell you that you're dealing with a biliary disorder. And I've written a review article at the bottom of the screen here if you want to learn more about the initial presentation and how the bile acids in primary biliary cirrhosis lead to puritis. The way this diagnosis is often made is that a woman presents with severe itching and she has an astute clinician who orders an alkphos level. And the alkaline phosphatase level will be very high in women who have primary biliary cirrhosis. Once you have itching and a high alkphos level, you begin to suspect this diagnosis and you can confirm it by ordering anti-mitochondrial antibodies. These are the hallmark of primary biliary cirrhosis. They're present in about 95% of patients. You can also sometimes see anti-nuclear antibodies or ANA antibodies in about 70% of patients. The liver function tests are sometimes mildly abnormal. The AST and ALT levels may be slightly increased, but they are not nearly as elevated as the ALKFOS level. And then finally, elevated bilirubin occurs late in the disease. When patients with PBC begin to develop jaundice, their disease is very progressive and they have a poor prognosis. Another key feature of this disorder is elevated serum lipids. These patients have obstruction to biliary flow, so they can't get lipids out in the bile. The total cholesterol can be greater than 1,000. You may know a normal total cholesterol level is under 200 or so. These patients can sometimes develop xanthomas, which are skin deposits of lipids as well. 
When you order imaging, you will see an absence of biliary obstruction. This is an important finding. Usually when people present with increased ALKFOS, one of the first tests you do is a right upper quadrant ultrasound. You're usually looking for common things like gallstones, but you will see none of that. You will see completely normal bile ducts in a patient with primary biliary cirrhosis, and that helps to cinch the diagnosis. A liver biopsy is the gold standard, but it's often not required because you can make the diagnosis by showing some of the other features I've talked about on this slide in the last one. So a typical case is a woman with severe itching and fatigue. The LFT show a markedly elevated ALKFOS level, and there are positive anti-mitochondrial antibodies. Most patients with this condition ultimately develop cirrhosis. That's why it has the word cirrhosis in the name of the disease, and ultimately they require a liver transplant for therapy. There is, however, one medical therapy that can be used. It's called ursodeoxycholic acid, and this is the structure of ursodeoxycholic acid shown in the screen. If you've watched the module on bile, you should recognize that this has a very similar structure to other bile acids, and that's why it's administered. It's similar to bile acids, but it's less toxic to hepatocytes. So with treatment over time, the ursodeoxycholic acid replaces many of the endogenous bile acids, and it causes less liver damage. This has been shown in clinical trials to improve liver function tests and slow the rate of disease progression. It's less clear whether it helps with the symptoms like itching and fatigue, but this is often administered to patients especially early in the course of their disease, to try and slow progression to the need for a liver transplant. It's high yield to know that primary biliary cirrhosis is associated with many other autoimmune disorders. Most women who have this have some other autoimmune disorder as well. One of the most common associations is Sjogren's syndrome. I talk about Sjogren's syndrome in the immunology modules. It is a condition where people develop dry eyes and dry mouth, and I put a picture of an eyeball on the screen here to remind you of this association. Our next biliary disorder is called primary sclerosyncholangitis, and many students confuse this with primary biliary cirrhosis because both conditions are rare. They both involve the biliary tree, and they both have the word primary in the name of the disease, but I'm going to teach you how to tell them apart in this module so that you never confuse the two. So primary sclerosyncholangitis is an autoimmune disorder, just like primary biliary cirrhosis, but the hallmark of this condition is inflammation, fibrosis, and strictures in the biliary tree. I've bolded the word fibrosis and strictures because what happens in this condition is that the biliary tree becomes stuck together and the bile therefore cannot flow. It involves the intra and extra hepatic bile ducts and that's different from primary biliary cirrhosis which only involves the bile ducts inside of the liver. And then finally, sclerosyncholangitis is strongly associated with ulcerative colitis. Basically, almost everyone who has this condition also has ulcerative colitis. You can think of it as mostly a complication of ulcerative colitis. 90% of primary sclerosyncholangitis patients also have inflammatory bowel disease, and of these, 90% have ulcerative colitis, not Crohn's. So the clinical features all derive from strictures that obstruct bile flow. If we have a bile duct here, inflammation leads to scar tissue that sticks together, and it blunts the flow of bile through the bile duct. So the symptoms will be biliary obstruction. This includes right upper quadrant pain, fatigue, and jaundice. If we go back to this picture, what's happening in sclerosing cholangitis is that there is inflammation of these bile ducts. As a result of that inflammation, scar tissue forms, fibrous tissue forms, and you develop strictures, which are obstructions to flow. And there will be many of these throughout the biliary tree in sclerosing cholangitis, and this will block the flow of bile. This is very different from biliary cirrhosis. In biliary cirrhosis, these bile ducts are completely normal. Remember what I told you before, if you do a right upper quadrant ultrasound in biliary cirrhosis, you will see normal bile ducts because they are not involved. The problem in biliary cirrhosis completely involves the liver. It is the intrahepatic bile ducts that are the problem. The extrahepatic ducts are completely normal. So once you understand that pathophysiology, the lab findings make sense. The lab findings include evidence of cholestasis. This is an increased alkaline phosphatase level, an elevated conjugated bilirubin level, and there are also usually mild increases in the AST and ALT levels. One characteristic of this disorder is elevated IgM levels. The reasons for this are not entirely understood, but up to half of patients will have a high IgM level. And then finally, there is an association between the P-ANCA antibody and sclerosyncholangitis. Up to 80% of sclerosyncholangitis patients are positive for P-ANCA. And this is easy to remember because P-ANCA is also associated with ulcerative colitis. And remember what I told you, you can largely think of this disorder as a complication of ulcerative colitis. If you do a biopsy of the bile ducts in this condition, which isn't often done, but if you do perform that test, the characteristic finding is called periductal fibrosis. This is called onion skin fibrosis of the bile ducts, and this is a picture of it on the screen. You can see that fibrous tissue is being laid down in circles around the bile duct, and this creates the appearance of an onion skin. 
So this diagnosis is often suspected in someone who has established ulcerative colitis and then develops cholestasis. So if someone with known ulcerative colitis develops jaundice and a high alkaline phosphatase level, you can suspect that they may have sclerosis and cholangitis. To confirm the diagnosis, you need to perform a cholangiogram. This is a picture of the biliary tree, and this will show the strictures from sclerosis and cholangitis. There are a couple of ways to do this. One way is called ERCP. This stands for endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. This involves putting a device into the duodenum and squirting some dye into the biliary tree to take a picture. Another way to do it is called MRCP, which is MRI cholangiography. And if you do either of these tests, what you will see is biliary strictures and dilatations. This is called beading. To understand beading, imagine that we have a normal bile duct that develops inflammation and scar tissue leading to a stricture. This stricture will block the bile flow, and as a result, the bile duct will dilate behind the stricture. Now imagine that this bile duct develops multiple strictures with a dilatation behind each stricture. What you will then get is something that looks like beads on a string. You will see a dilatation followed by a narrowing portion from the stricture, and then another dilatation followed by another narrowing, and then another dilatation followed by another narrowing, and you get the idea. This looks like a series of beads connected together, and that's called beading. And that's what you can see on a cholangiogram in sclerosis and cholangitis. On the left side of the screen is a normal cholangiogram. You can see that the edges of the bile ducts are nice and smooth, and they don't dilate or narrow from a stricture. On the right side of the screen is a cholangiogram from a patient with sclerosis and cholangitis. You can see that some of the biliary structures are very narrow, like this one I'm circling right here. Others are dilated, like the one I'm drawing my pen around here. And this is what a cholangiogram in a patient with sclerosis and cholangitis looks like. The treatment of this disorder often involves endoscopic therapy. This is where an endoscope is placed into the biliary tree so that the bile ducts can be dilated or sometimes stented. This will break up those strictures and allow bile to flow. Often these patients progress to require a liver transplant, and importantly, they undergo annual screening for cholangiocarcinoma, which is a very rare cancer of the bile ducts. The risk of this cancer is increased in patients who have sclerosis and cholangitis. So here's a table showing the difference between primary biliary cirrhosis and primary sclerosis and cholangitis. Many people confuse these, but you shouldn't if you've paid attention to what I've been saying on the last few slides. So primary biliary cirrhosis involves the intrahepatic bile ducts. All those extrahepatic bile ducts that you can see with ultrasound and other imaging techniques will be normal. It's associated with Sjogren's disease. Remember that it presents with itching as its predominant feature. Antimitochondrial antibodies are elevated in patients with this condition and there is a medical therapy, ursodeoxycholic acid. Sclerosis and cholangitis, on the other hand, involves intra- and extrahepatic bile ducts. Remember that you can think of this largely as a complication of ulcerative colitis, and patients with this condition have those abnormal cholangiograms like I showed you a few slides ago. I'll finish this module with a few additional details about cholangiocarcinoma. This is a rare cancer of the bile duct epithelial cells. Do not confuse this with gallbladder carcinoma, which is a different problem. This is a cancer of the epithelial cells in the biliary tree. The symptoms usually arise from obstruction of bile flow, so these patients present with jaundice and right upper quadrant pain and elevated ALKFOS levels. And the key risk factors are anything that causes chronic biliary inflammation, and there are two conditions you should know about for step one of your boards. The first one is primary sclerosis and cholangitis, which we've been talking about in this module. It's strongly associated with ulcerative colitis, and it's a major risk factor for cholangiocarcinoma. The second risk factor is very rare. It is a helminth infection called Clonorchis sinensis. It's the Chinese liver fluke. I've shown a picture of a worm here on the screen to remind you of this. And you can get this helminth infection from eating contaminated fish. I talk about it more in the infectious disease modules. And that concludes our module on biliary disorders.